Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. Hey, everyone. Before we get started with the show, I'm excited to announce two things. First is that my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed, is now live on Amazon. So go get it. The second thing is we have a new sponsor, Qualified.com. I'm going to tell you about them in the next couple seconds here and also how you can get a free copy of my book thanks to them. So who are these people? Well, Qualified is the number one live chat and chatbot platform for Salesforce and Pardot. Sales reps can have real-time, personalized conversations with who? Your hottest website visitors. So I want you to know, I don't just partner with anyone. I genuinely love these guys, and the platform, we use it at my company. Our sales team loves it. We've closed a lot of deals based on it, Um, had a lot of great conversations with prospects too. So, you know, a lot of marketing these days is, what, hurry up and wait right? Fill out this form. And then if we pass you over to sales, maybe you'll swap six emails with them to find a good time to talk. But what if a prospect is doing research right now and they would chat now? Why not give them the opportunity? So the best part is your company actually decides what leads are worth a live chat. There's a lot of noise out there. You don't want to talk to everyone. So Qualified actually connects to Salesforce and Pardot and it's able to pull in lead and contact information so you can specifically know if you're talking to a VIP, a VP, a decision maker. It's really kind of like magic. Now, if you don't know who someone is, well, what happens then, Casey? Well, that's when the bots come in handy. Chat bots can then ask you know, questions to further qualify a lead. Find out if maybe this is someone you do want to talk to. And they can book meetings while your sales team is out. And they can wake up the next morning with a bunch of meetings on their calendar. Now, here's the promo. If you are a company that wants to give your sales team this ability, right, to be able to talk to decision makers right when they're on your website, do this. Go to qualify.com and start a chat, right? They use their own tool, of course. Start a chat. Tell them that Casey sent you. If you have Salesforce Pardot, when you schedule and then do a demo, they will send you a free copy of my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed. Not bad, right? Well, it's only while supplies last. So, Hop on this thing today. And that's it for sponsors. Let's get to the show. That's it. We're live. We are live and cranking, recording. Oh, man, I'm so excited. Today's guest. Wait till you meet her. Wait till I unleash her on you and this whole world. She is a growth operations badass. What is growth operations, you you ask? Well, funny enough, we're going to be chatting about that. You may have heard of revenue operations. Uh, op stars. She was the content chair or is the content chair for that. Nearly 20 years of experience in the marketing and customer success world. Winner of the 2018 Revy Stack Master Award. Man. And also president of MOCA, which is a cool acronym if ever I've heard one, for Marketing Operations Cross Company Alliance, but they're going to rename that to Growth Operations Community, which we're going to talk about. Founder and CEO of Navigate Consulting Group, Melissa McCready. Welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Now, I almost lost myself in your introduction. There's just, you are doing so much. Yeah, I definitely have my hands on a lot of things, and uh, that's the best way that I operate. For some reason, if you give me one thing to do, I won't do it as well as if I have 10. So that's my MO. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of just dive in and go crazy. Yes, and get a lot done in the process. So that is one thing I think people think you you don't focus, you don't get much done. That's not true. So I definitely am a person who will tell you that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be smashing stuff today, and I think this is perfect timing. The theme is really around this topic of growth operations, this new area of exploration that um, you'd like us all to head in the right direction in the marketing world. And so to begin this part, I need to hand you this thing. It's really heavy. One second. Uh, okay, here it is. Let's, uh, here's Thor's hammer. All right. uh, you got it? Okay, I okay. got it. Take that and smash for me some kind of marketing <sighs> myth, bogus strategy, 
misconception. Take it away. Yeah, so I think revenue operations, the coin phrase of it is not correct because revenue is the result of growth. And so I believe that we rename growth operations from revenue operations, and it makes a heck of a lot more sense. And why is that? So when we talk about revenue operations, people go, well, what is it really? And I'll tell you what people think it is mainly and what it actually is. Yeah. So what it what people think it is most of the times is that it's ahead of sales. And it's so much more because as we know, when we align sales, marketing, customer success, and channel operations, the effectiveness and the lift that you get in revenue and accelerated revenue is significant. So we're hearing that from serious decisions. We're hearing that from lean data. And with that said, growth operations is rev operations, but growth is what you're doing, right? And operations is how you do it. So I believe that growth operations is a better thing to say. Wow. So Could you say that, that again? So that, that phrase, mm-hmm. that, that seemed like, a, okay, I, I need to write that one down. <laughs> growth operations is the is what you oh my gosh I can't say it again oh, I know to I totally part. did I totally <laughs> screwed you up it's like it was beautiful okay hold on so growth operations is the how you do it whereas revenue operations is a result of what you do right and to your point it's great that you've got the result out there but that doesn't speak to how you get there. Yeah. And the, and the journey, and we talk about the customer journey and the journey is growth, right? Mm-hmm. It's, we need to go from X number to Y number and how do we get there and how do we ap- operationalize that process and make it efficient and make it fluid and aligned? I think that's the hardest part is that we've been on this journey of aligning sales and marketing and customer success is starting to come into the fold and channel operations has been left out a little bit. I don't know if it's been left out as much as it. it's a bit of a subset of sales in some sense, but I also think that it's a subset of marketing uh, because the fact that when you've got a partner portal, for example, it's there to provide marketing and training for your channel partners. So there's a lot of marketing to it, but of course there's sales as well because you are doing deal registration. So I think at the end of the day, you have to have all those things aligned, people, process, technology. And it comes back to the same stuff I talked about at the beginning of my career over 20 years ago, people, process, technology, we're talking things like customer master, which is now a customer data platform or a CDP. We're coming back to a lot of the foundational pieces and the next piece is growth from there, right? And so I think we've got the foundation down um, in a sense, but there's some, there are definitely some nuances to that. And there's definitely some tweaking that needs to happen on the foundational piece to get to the growth piece. And it's funny, Casey, because in reading your book, you said you have four words that you like to use. And, and that first one is foundation. And the next one is growth. And, and then we get into automation and then we get into reporting. And I couldn't agree with that more. And I think there's another layer to that too, which is the analysis because reporting and analysis to me are two different things. Mm, But I think you just, just getting to the reporting piece is difficult enough. You've got data quality issues. You have inconsistent processes. You have changes in people and org structures and changes in product and all these things that can get thrown in, in the midst of moving the needle on revenue. So with that, that growth operations piece isn't a static thing. It's a growing thing, just like it is growth operations. It is consistently growing and morphing and changing as the business changes. You know, people process technology changes change the way that you're going to go about doing that, sometimes more significant in some situations than others. Got it. Huh. There's a lot to, I love that. There's so many things here. One, how did you make the realization on this? concept of the growth operations because you you're like in it and in, in all the rev ops and all the different you know yeah op stars and all these different things like what did, yeah did something tickle a hair in the back of your neck that said like oh, maybe we need to focus yeah. elsewhere so a couple of things so um when i was working on content for op stars there were a multitude of conversations with experts all throughout the field um getting to talk with the analysts and whatnot and So serious decisions, for example, came in uh, at the beginning of last year, and they had announced 
prior to um, Oxstar's Mysterious Decision Summit. So they were doing the big announcement there, and I did a little reveal at the first op stars that we did in New York City and came in and said that the field of revenue operations, the amount of job titles with RevOps and titles in general across LinkedIn had increased like somewhere in the likes of over 60%. And I thought, okay, great. Let's, let me take a look at that. And what I found is that a lot of people being called a chief revenue officer had sales backgrounds. They did not come out of customer success. They did not come out of marketing. And they had very little experience doing that. And so that struck a nerve because, again, sales is not what should be leading. Frankly, it should be the customer success side. It should be focused on the customer, right? Companies that do well, number one, treat their employees great. Number two, treat their customers great. And you can't treat your customers great if you don't treat your employees great, because your employees will definitely reflect back onto your customers. So right. with that, coming in as a chief revenue officer, looking at how those people were being hired and what they were looking for and their skill sets, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think revenue is immediately tied to sales, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the perception that's out there. When you say that word, you think money, you think sales. And at the same time, marketing and customer success are not cost centers. They're there as a part of that growth process, and they have been treated as such as being a cost center. So another thing that came up that really um, struck a nerve with me is I'm seeing a trend of people getting rid of CMOs. And instead, they're leading with demand gen, and they're not thinking about the brand and the loyalty along with revenue growth. And growth, to me, means growth in revenue, but it also is growth in your brand awareness, as well as your customer loyalty. And that's where marketing customer success are critical components. So growth to me encapsulate, encapsulates, I can't even say that word, you know, encapsulates uh, what it is that is needed to grow revenue, not just sales growing revenue. Mm -hmm. And so that CMO piece where um, you've heard large companies, I believe it was, uh, was it Coca-Cola or Disney? One of the two. Uh, they just got rid of their CMO and kind of restructured and put like demand gen under a CRO. Um, and in doing that, you know, there's this vision that comes from a CMO and there's this experience of brand and website and, you know, working with channel operations and working with sales operations that you're going to find in a CMO that you will not find in somebody who's been ahead of sales. The likelihood of them having that depth of experience is um, as a CRO with that sales focus as much, I, I actually would go so far to say that a CMO would make a better CRO than a head of sales would, but people would totally disagree with that in some cases. And that's not a one size fits all. So I just want to make, <laughs> make that clear. But I do believe that a CMO tends to have a wider perspective and a bigger vision. And that makes a lot more sense to me to keep that skill set is so critical. And it's going to be a real nightmare for companies that are doing that to come back because the recruitment effort after a CMO sees that, they're going to go, yeah, I don't want to touch that company. They've done that before. And, you know, hopefully they don't make the same mistake twice, but they made it the first time. And unless there's some pretty major shifts, I probably would be very uh, hesitant if I were a CMO to do that. You know what? Uh, I'm completely biased. Um, or mostly biased, but I tend to see what you're talking <laughs> about with marketing, looking at a, at a bigger picture where sales can be yeah. very focused. And, and not that it's bad. I mean, you need sales focused on bringing in the bacon this month, this mm -hmm. week, this quarter, this end of year. And right. that narrow focus, but not narrow in a bad way, like they are focused on the, what deal can I close, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to being focused on yeah, you know, the the whole machine as a, across the broad spectrum. Yeah, yeah, and I think when you get the alignment that revenue operations, I'm calling it now growth operations for the rest of this time. Yeah, <laughs> but what growth operations can do is that you've got a machine, and that's exactly it. that's that automation piece that you were talking about in your book, right? In order to automate, you need to have the entire customer journey mapped out and the different pieces of that aligned and automated, right? And you need to be able to report across the different functional areas of sales, marketing, customer success, and channel. Because all of those things can give clues to what's working and what isn't. And they can also help you double down that if you're looking 
you know, to drive revenue in, and you're in the last quarter of your fiscal year, hey, there's some stuff you may be able to do to pull it in, right? Have it be that you do a call blitz, but marketing is aligned with that and the customer success team has consistent messaging. I think that's another piece too. I'm going to go off on an offshoot here about consistent messaging. I think it's really difficult to have consistent mes messaging unless you have that alignment and you want that journey to tell a story and be a story, right? I want, if I'm going to go and purchase something, I want to, from the time that I'm getting ready to purchase, get educated, then I'm purchasing, I want the support that's there. And I want to know what else there is to buy. So all those three things are important and critical pieces for me to feel like a company has got its act together, that they're able to do that effectively and to keep the communication consistent. So I'm not confused about what this company is offering. And I, I see companies do that. They will switch their messaging all too often. And then people go, well, what are you then? Right. And it's a, it's a tricky thing to shift gears and messaging, but do it in a way that is aligned across the entire sales funnel from first touch to first win to first and you know next renewal. Those things need to be aligned and tightly aligned. Right. Right. You know, you know, to summarize, couldn't we just say, you know, CMOs take over the world? You know, CMO for president, <laughs> CMO for you know, CMO 2020. Cool, CMO. There we go. And yeah. CMO <laughs> You know, CMO should be CEO. <laughs> Everyone else, you know, sales is not yeah. so bad. And, I mean, and I that big picture. Yeah, and and so um, Lean Data recently did a study, and they talked about kind of the makeup of the CRO and what that looks like. And a lot of companies um, from that survey, just give a general overview on this. They said that um, people have been reporting into a CRO, but also the COO. And I can share that my experience, the last company that I was at full time um, went uh, and were purchased by another security vendor, we'll call it. And we made that switch. So we went from when I started with them, global business systems, so setting up all the systems, although it was the process as well, even though it was called systems. Um, and then we decentralized. And I was devastated because I knew in order for us to go, we need to be aligned and, and to get that alignment is tricky, right? So um, they decentralized us. And of course, it built silos from doing that. Yeah. And I made the case to the COO and said, listen, I really think this is the path that we should go to bring this all together and really get a deep view and analysis of what is going on across the entire customer journey. And I sold them on it, which was pretty amazing. <laughs> and then we did it. And then, yeah, there was, you know, it, I think if we hadn't have done that, the valuation wouldn't have been as high um, because we had our act together with being able to say, hey, board members, you know, hey, people looking to purchase this company, we can show you what's actually going on. So I think that um, it was an incredible experience at that organization. It was by far the most rocket ship growth I've ever experienced. Um, and I've ever seen firsthand, they went from like 75 million to 275 million in a matter of like under two years. So uh, building the foundation and the infrastructure and getting to the automation uh, was in, you know, 90 hour a week job for sure. Uh, it was also, like I said, terrific experience. But, you know, the fact that we went through those different iterations of what it was going to be for growth operations really it, it was it was challenging. So I've seen it done different ways at the same company and, mm. and just clients that I've had, they're they're trying to crack the nut of how it's going to work best for them. That's hard because it's it's very situational. As I said earlier, it's not a one size fits all. And I think that that definitely is kind of another myth to smash that yeah, smash. one yeah, one org structure doesn't work for all organizations. And um, decentralized doesn't necessarily work for organizations that um, do better culturally uh, with having a team all together in one room reporting into one person. Um, it depends on the experience of the people who are in the room. It depends on the mindset. Um, I tend to find that so long as you have the right mindset, it doesn't matter what structure you're in, it can work. And it's a collaborative mindset. And there are people that come into doing growth operations, they're collaborative. Um, they are lifelong learners. Uh, they are people who are open and willing to make changes quickly, uh, but also willing to call out the risks and be willing to take risks. 
So I think those are, are a common theme in, in the class of the people that you're going to find working in growth operations that will be there for the long term. And um, it, you know, it's also, here's another myth I want to smash, yeah, <laughs> which smash is about the, audit, about the tools, right? Just mm-hmm. because you have certification on a tool doesn't make you an expert. And I think... <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm, but yeah. I'm 30, I mean, I'm, I'm a 30X certified uh, guru. <laughs> yeah, well, 30 acts is a little different, but you know, early on in the careers, you know, somebody comes in and they just I have know. their Marketo certification. They're not ready to go. They're not ready to just jump in. You have to understand, you know, that word. Uh, again, in your book, you say strategy is kind of like eh, it's a little bit abused, and yeah. I I agree with that entirely because um, to me, strategy is much more simple than what people think. It's literally having a plan yeah. and being able to say, this is what I need to do to execute on it. And if I don't have that, I'm dead in the water anyways. I'm just going to be shooting from the hip. Who wants yeah. that? Think and about that the inverse not, of that, right? The inverse of not being, yeah. not having a plan, forget the word strategic. Okay. Having a plan yeah. and executing toward a goal. Okay. So if you're not doing that, you don't have a plan and you don't have a goal. You're just, just going, just doing. Okay. <laughs> that, that doesn't sound good in any situation. <laughs> no, no. I mean, and, and you think of that in, in the sense of, and I'm sure that you've dealt with this too, Casey, is that you walk into a client and you're like, where's your marketing calendar? And they're like, oh, we don't have one. And I'm like, oh no, here we right. go. They point this to like a calendar on the wall. One. It's April. Yeah. Here's the calendar on the wall with like snowflakes yeah. or firefighters, but like nothing uh-huh. written on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then people are like, here's our marketing calendar and it's all email. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> so, you know, you do see that. And the good news is that uh, we can have conversations with those people and set them in the right direction. But yeah, that's, that's a big one. So I'm kind of jumping all over the place. And I know that yeah. we had talked about kind of the org structure, right? And coming back to center on the org structure, um, that decentralized model, typically what you'll see is you'll see somebody like a CRO um, sometimes they're called COs in some scenarios, but you'll see with decentralized that that collaborative mindset is critical for that to work. So I think that it's critical for it to work in general, but it's most critical in the decentralized. And that's hard because if you think about it, this growth operations thing hasn't been around that long, right? We're only really talking a couple of years. And it's amazing to think like 20 years ago, and when Siebel was going under and I was doing working with Siebel systems integrators and then Salesforce came on the scene and yeah. how different and how much it's changed. Um, but uh, there was all the decentralized versus centralized and, you know, data centralization and all these sorts of things. And now we're in organ automation centralization, right? So when we talk about the organization, you know, we talk about the people. So the decentralized We'll have, you know, marketing over and marketing operations, sales operations over and sales, and uh, customer success and channel partners, same sort of flow with them. Yeah. Um, and then they'll have, they'll do usually a steering committee sort of model, right? Mm. So we'll come together. So an example can be, I know that um, running a change control team is super, super important. So going through from the systems perspective, having change control and having tools to help automate that process as well so that you have an input and an output process and that you're clear on testing and you're clear on sign off and that you can set proper expectations. And having that also affords you to look at, do I have enough people? Do I have the right skill sets? And, and really to do a gap analysis. So right. using um, a racing model or a V2 mom model um, that will allow you to really dig deep into making sure that changes aren't made without proper sign off and a proper process to follow. I think that's one of the one of the key things that a decentralized model absolutely has to have to operate well um, and to also reduce risk a great deal. Yeah. So yeah. Well tell, yeah, tell the me risks this, get really high. Yeah, this change control team, you know mm-hmm. is it does every team that's in these different silos need this, um, or at least a function? And what does it look like? How how do you? What's the how to? How do you actually build that? It's just a couple people, and do they? Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's it's a team. It's a team sport for sure. Um, so as an example, if you have changes on the the lead process, right? 
marketing needs to know, the customer success team needs to know, because there may be different data points that are being collected and there could be collisions and processes, right? So if you have something specific in the sales process or a validation rule over in Salesforce, if you've got Marketo or Pardot and you've got some stuff set up around programs that um, a certain change in a value will trigger something to happen, it'll trigger a nurture track or whatever the case may be, um, it's really, really important to have those discussions to make sure that that impact uh, risk is mitigated. So what it tends to look like is, I, I can tell you how I've run them in the past. And there's, um, I like to use Salesforce as an example, and there is a free tool um, for change control that you can use and to customize uh, on change control on the app exchange that I will use that'll basically say, We'll put it over on the homepage with a link and say, you know, request a change or uh, request help or whatever. And that change control committee operates off of those change requests and prioritizes them and looks at how much effort it's going to take um, to say this is when it's going to get delivered. And then there's a communication process, just like a regular ticketing system, but it's specifically for changes within the system. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then it's reporting out, right? Like how many changes we have this week. There's a communication that goes out to every team and the operational team. Then each of them are required to communicate that out within their functional area. Um, so that's also an important thing. Like if you have a uh, weekly sales meeting, if you have a weekly marketing meeting, that should be on the agenda or customer success, kind of just staff meeting and check-ins, put that in there. Right. Works right. really, really well. Here's what we've got coming up. Here's what we've done. And also allows you to keep honest on how you're doing with MBOs, right? Mm. So when in setting MBOs, first and foremost, everybody should be tied to revenue for sure. Like, and I even think that marketing should be comped and customer success should be comped in on a percentage of that as well, based on contribution, right? Mm. So if you're doing renewals, you're already getting um, some sort of commission on that, right? But on the marketing side, it, it really hasn't. And I think that that's one thing I hope changes. And I'm seeing a little bit of that happening where there is more of a bonus tied in with marketing for helping boost revenue, right? If, you, if you're over, if you're at 110% and marketing's got, you know, a 40% contribution, they, marketing should have bonuses on that, right? And the MBOs should all be tied at the top. So whatever the overall goals are, those should trickle down to each of the functional areas. So with that, you've got the functional areas of marketing, sales, customer success, and channel ops. Each of them are going after the same goal, right? We want to build uh, X amount of net new customers. We want to get a percentage renewal rate. We want to have a customer loyalty score. We want to have a net promoter score. All of these things are tied together, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody has... Uh, visibility into one another. Right. So I think um, when we talk about the change control element of it, and we talk about those MBOs, we can look at those change control elements and say, are we servicing what we're supposed to be based on what those overall MBOs are? And, and get tactical and say, we spent too much time on this and not enough time on this, or we shifted priorities here because of these things. And we can have a frank conversation with right. measurable, tangible things to look at. So instead of going into the exec team and going to an you know, e-staff meeting and saying, we didn't finish this, we can say, we did these things and this has been shifted because of these things and they afforded us this versus if we went this path, it would have afforded us that. But that also comes back into road mapping, right? And that's having a plan to say, like, here's what we're supposed to do and when to also be able to say, we had to shift the wins because of mm -hmm. these things happening. We had a new product release and we had to pull back on the product release because there was a bug or whatever happened, those things can, can shift the needle in, in any organization. So keeping um, real about expectation setting, but change control gives you um, a bit of a litmus test to make sure that you're on the right path and you're spending the time in the right areas and that people are aligned and communicating and there's a communication structure to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and it's just a little bit of, it's like, it, it's intentional, right? We're being intentional about everything mm -hmm. we're doing, whether yes. it's mapping out the buyer's journey and the customer experience or being intentional about the changes we're making, the opposite of just shooting from the hip. And then that's how you end up with 300 yeah. fields in your, in your Salesforce account that, <laughs> that all are the same account type fields, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and by the way, uh, just a tidbit for the uh, folks who are listening here. If you don't know about Field Trip, it is a free app exchange tool for Salesforce that will give you a percentage of field usage report across your objects, including custom objects. So I definitely want to give a plug. That is another one that is awesome to have when you're having a conversation about what are we actually using. Um, that is excellent to, to definitely have that as well in, in your um, toolkit. That's awesome. Shout out to Field Trip. That sounds good. One of those things is to be able to know. Otherwise, you end up with yeah. this yeah. snowball effect. And it's a re- yeah, it's a ring lead product too, which is oh, kind no of kidding. interesting, right? So yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just realized word. that this week. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, look, it's ring lead product. I didn't realize that. Oh. Yeah. Could they brand that better or was it on purpose that you didn't quite know it was them until it was too late? Uh. I've been using this change control thing since 2005, 2006. Wow. So it's been around forever. It's been around forever. So, yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's just as simple as you can build a custom object and do it yourself. But why sure. why reinvent the wheel when you got something that'll get you going right away, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I'd love to ask you about story. I know you're you're a great storyteller. Um, and there's a, there's a couple. <laughs> and this always happens where we were chatting about a couple of fun and exciting things even before we hit record. And it's like, Oh, we got to save some <laughs> of those. Some of those are just for us, but some of those other people can hear, but talk to me about story. It, you had mentioned earlier the idea of having consistent messaging, but also being a storyteller is telling a story in your marketing, but also across the whole operations. How do you, how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it, it comes down to growth operations. That is a huge charter for growth operations is that in order to get consistent messaging, everybody's got to be talking in the organization that is doing any messaging out, which is basically anybody in a customer facing function. Mm. So when we talk about um, who our customers are, defining that um, throughout the stages of the life cycle, Serious Decisions has some really great models for this. And you can actually just Google up uh, customer journey model Serious Decisions, and you'll get to see some of those visual representations showing you how to do that, where it'll say, everybody, this is how we define who our best buyers are. Uh, mind you that that's also not an easy thing to do. So I'm going to go to an offshoot on that comment, which is, in order to do really good segmentation, you have to run a business for a little while in order to really understand who your customers are and who your buyers are and, and your, who your prospects are, right? Mm-hmm. And who are your, your champions, um, who are going to be the, the referral types. And um, having a CDP, a customer data platform, is really important to do that. Um, but it's also not the most affordable thing. So you're not going to find a CDP in a smaller company. I mean, your right. entry point in... Um, for most of them is, is a minimum of 100K. So it is very cost prohibitive. I think that's going to change. I think CDPs are going to start to become more affordable. Um, when you see like the Discover Org and the Sixth Sense and the lead spaces, um, I do think that eventually we see that modeling, just like with any sort of enterprise thing, they start mm-hmm. to they scale it back. Some like to start small and go forward, but um, there's definitely a huge need for it in the market space in order to really use AI, artificial intelligence, to identify those segments. And that segment definition is a huge part of, the, of getting the messaging correct, is understanding who we're talking to. And when we understand who we talk to, we're always speaking in the terms of why do you care. And I think that a lot of times people go and they push with the product. But at the end of the day, why does it matter to me? If you're not answering that question, you're dead in the water. It's very difficult to talk about the value of a product if you don't understand your customer enough to say, this is what it means to you yeah. based on your role, based on your level in the organization, based on your experiences, and doing your homework on people, right? I'm going to jump over on that note for a second to ABM, account-based marketing. Well, well hold on a second. Term, can, we, can we talk about just how yeah. you do your your homework on your buyers? If you don't know, like, yeah. why do you care? Like, you need to find out. Yeah. And if you don't, wh- what's your approach? So how do you find that out? Do you interview them? Well, what's your best approach? Yes. I love doing um, think tank groups and getting people into a room um, talking to people that are in the industry who, if I explain something to them, if they get it or not, 
and then what they get about it and what they think. So it's a lot of exploratory questions going into it and um, reaching out to people who would be using this stuff, I think is um, the most important, but also talking to people who wouldn't use this stuff to see if they could even understand and grasp the concept. So I think a lot of companies misstep in that is they don't go to that second level of people who don't know about it. They probably have never used anything like it to get their perspective to see if you've broken it down enough for people to understand what it is and what it means to them. So mm-hmm. that value, um, that value building exercise is extremely critical from helping to define what it is that people need. And then the segmentation is how does that look different in different parts of the country based on the makeup of things? How does that right. look when we talk about that job role and that job level? How does that look um, when we talk about the size of a, an organization? So when we think in those terms, um, then we go to the next layer, which is what are the things, and this is where uh, companies like Bombora will come in and um, the CDPs will play with Bombora as well, and they'll give that intent data. And that intent data will help us to look at those behaviors and clump them in a way where we can say, if I am in this space, this is the best level of person in this role. These are the keywords that they're going to look at the most. This is the buying cycle that they take, right? They start um, by going and investigating and they'll download white papers and here's the types of stuff that they like to read. And that also comes from customer success, by the way, right? So customer success has a huge hand in this as well because they're going to say the makeup of our customers is this. Marketing is going to say the front end looks like this and sales is going to say the wins look like this. You're going to marry all those KPIs together, Right. And the thing with CDPs that make them so powerful with the AI is they take all that data and they give you back the intelligence of the results. So if, for example, LeadSpace will come back and it'll say, hey, um, this is your buyer and this is what they look like. And here's your secondary. The propensity to buy when they're this combination of data points that you've collected is higher and maybe it's 6x higher than this combination of those data points, right? So company size, job level, location keywords that they search on, um, and time of year, right? Seasonality also plays into that. So, um, and then you also have to think about that from a channel partner perspective, which a lot of people haven't gotten to, which is, well, how is that different? Because your channel partners, they're sellers as well. And guess what? They're also buyers. There are a lot of channel partners that will also be buyers of your product. That's true. So that happens a lot. And um, a lot of people forget about that and the, and the importance of the channel partners and utilizing the channel community to get that feedback as well, right? They're your extended sales team, they're your extended marketers and working with them to have those conversations. So there are a lot of KPIs involved in doing this. And that's why it does take the plan and the thought and really getting deep into the tactics of the automation, right? That's why that change control becomes so critical right. is because those data points and collecting them correctly so people can trust the data. Ha, ha, ha. I yeah, laugh at that exactly. <laughs> That's always the big one, right? Um, and getting everybody to trust the data to be able to formulate, you know, the best customer journey path that you can get. So Yeah. 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 You know, I think I saw a stat around customer data, something like no one does trust their data like 96 (laughs) percent of all marketers don't trust their data (laughs) yeah and sales doesn't trust the data and forecast accuracy is you know one of the big hot buttons for sales right right it's difficult um you know and a lot of it it's people process technology so the technology isn't going to drive your sales right the people are going to drive your sales the technology is nearly there is a toolkit to support yeah. Um, and it certainly can help guide process by all means, but it is not going to sell for you. Just like the key, do not enter in the data themselves. You've got to do the work. So and, true. you know, as much as you can with a sales team to mitigate how much they have to enter in, the better. But there's also critical things that need to be there. And, you know, your your BANT questions, for example, depending if you're using a value selling model or whatever sales model you're using these days. Um, there have to be gates to capture the information in order to move forward so that you do get consistent process being followed. And the tools certainly can help with that. But still, if people aren't getting the wrong data, then 
you're out of luck. <laughs> out of luck. There's so <laughs> many moving pieces. I, I can see why yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, you've been consulting in this area for a while. I can see why you would need someone like you to be able to come in and just make sense of this. Because it'd be like, there's so many moving parts. Like, how, to even get it straight, you know, yeah. my, my next question to you is like, who are you? How did you become this? <laughs> I know you talked to you know, the uh, growth operations, witch self-professed, yeah. <laughs> how did you become this, yeah. this wizard witch of all these things? Take us back to like, you know, little Melissa days, did we running around going growth operations or like, tell, tell us the story. <laughs> It, it's crazy. So um, I had no idea what I wanted to do going into college. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll be a sports psychologist. And I professionally figure skated. So when I say that, I mean that I was competitive. And then I taught, not that I was on this like, uh, circuit or whatever people that you see on TV, but I, I lived and breathed it, right. And so it afforded me to handle a lot of things at once. So thank goodness for that. But I really thought sports psychology was going to be it. And I got into it. I'm like, why am I making money doing this? And right. You could go be an intern for the right uh, local NFL, you know, the <laughs> NHL hockey team or right. something. Yeah, it's it's tough. Well, and what really um, stood out for me, interestingly enough, was statistics. I really love them. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, who loves statistics? Well, apparently I did. And didn't realize like how much I liked it. And then I was going for, um, I thought I was going to become a lawyer and uh, realized very quickly that I didn't want to do that. And I um, went for my MBA and uh, my MBA is in training and development, which was computer-based training. So it was kind of like, oh, for some reason, I really like computers. So funny story, um, when I was in kindergarten eons ago, there was a program that was done uh, by IBM that they came in to schools and I grew up in Chicago, outside of Chicago, Illinois, and they picked a school district to put computers in. And so I've been on a computer since I was five years old. That puts me at like, <clears throat> doing this. So, I know, um, right? Yeah. Yeah. Somehow, some way it followed me. And so I started working in law and I was programming in, um, creating all these templates and stuff and programming and programming in DOS. I, I just like did it. I'm like, okay, this is whatever. Didn't think anything of it. Then I was working at the next company while I was going for an MBA and the intranet came online. And I was working as a contracts manager of all things. And I was managing databases and access database. And they wanted to improve upon the process for contract management. So I said, oh, okay, well, I can create a form and we've got the intranet now. So someone can create a form and it drops it into access. And then I can spin off an email from there and then they can electronically sign. And so it was like a two week process that I got down to like 15 minutes. Okay. Still, still had no idea what I was going to end up in. You refined <laughs> it down though. I was just like, okay, so obviously there was a lot of stuff there and I tried a lot of different things and I worked, um, gosh, in property management, doing accounting, um, doing sales, doing marketing, um, I, I taken gigs doing like interim customer success head. There's like been so many different things that I've tried because this really didn't exist back then, right? 20 years ago, the stuff was not really there. And I happened to be working at ADP and I was working in sales and they had SalesLogix database. And I was just like, whoa, this stuff is awesome and killed it. And then they were like, hey, can you train the new people on it? I'm like, yeah, sure. Well, while I was doing that, there was a consulting firm that came in that was doing Siebel. And they kind of took me over to the side and they should have done this, but I'm glad that they did because it completely <laughs> set the course for everything and said, you need to come and work with us. And I said, okay. So then it was project management. And like, I was sorry, running, not sorry. Um, <laughs> they yeah, stole you totally, away. right? <laughs> So I was doing marketing for them. I was doing some project management stuff. I got people certified and off and running. Um, and at that point, I was like, I need to leave where I'm at. I was in Illinois at the time. And so made the jump out to Silicon Valley, spent 20 years in Silicon Valley, crazy enough. I just recently, well, in the last three years, moved down to SoCal. Um, but over the course of that time, watching everything happen, I watched the fall of Siebel. I lived in the apartments mm. right next to Siebel and got to see people thought and Oracle coming in. You know, they were just, it was funny to watch because there was um, an ice rink and restaurant 
that was right across the street from Siebel. There were a couple of restaurants. And what mm-hmm. PeopleSoft and Oracle did was that in front of the Siebel building, they would drive trucks that said Oracle and PeopleSoft and like, you know, stuff why Siebel sucked, right? <laughs> they were driving up things like this. It was, it was a fun time to watch all this stuff go down and then wow. Siebel collapse. And I remember I was brought in to do some product review at Siebel and they showed me their online CRM. They were trying to go for it. But it looks so Microsoftish, and they built it on Microsoft, by the way. Um, and it was just like, yeah, no. And I had started playing with Salesforce already. And at that time, still, we didn't really know all this stuff was going to happen with this. But I thought the whole time, every company needs this. It's a customer-facing set of applications that we need to run a business. So that at that point in time, it really set because that was a trivial moment for anybody in the CRM space with Siebel. You either were going to make the jump out of it or you're going to stay in it and take the risk. And I took the risk and I'm so glad that I did. I'm forever grateful that I, I made that decision. Yeah. So, and here I am all this time later after working for so many different companies and getting the experience across the entire customer journey with the systems and the processes and the types of people and really having a full um, view on that. And there's not many of us that do. So it's always fun talking with people because I'll it, you get so many different perspectives on things and you can never, you never know everything. You're never going to know everything. I'm glad that I don't know everything. Um, I am very happy not to be Google or Siri <laughs> or Alexa. That is no fun in life. So it, it keeps me learning. And that is another thing too, is you know, we talk about how I got here and how I'm staying here is that I'm, I'm constantly reading and learning and networking. Those things are so critical um, on this path because it's a new journey for all of us. Um, and we're trying to solidify what this really is so that just like CRM, you know, back in the days over 20 years ago now, um, that this holds. And I wow. absolutely believe that it will. And I'll, I'll be the risk taker to say, I'm going to take this risk and I'm going to bet on growth operations for sure. You know, I, I see where from your background, and this is why we ask these questions, like you've done all mm-hmm. these different things. And so yeah, you've, you've had a chance to, I mean, and we've always talked about how if you're a marketer, you can get a chance to do any kind of sales. It makes you that much stronger because you understand yeah. the other side, if you will. But to your point, I mean, you've been in the customer side, the success side, mm-hmm. the sales side, all of it. And so it, it's almost good that you don't have necessarily a loyalty to any one side so that you're able to bring right. them all together into the single operations yeah. channel. Yeah. Well, I think that's where growth really strikes a chord with me is because I've only been focused on growth. And so I thought while I was getting experience in doing different projects that it was extremely important to understand all aspects. And I shouldn't say the word all because it sounds too definite, um, but really understanding as much as I could from different perspectives. Like, what does a POC process look like, right? That's a critical part in the sales funnel to get to close. And, and if you don't have that down right, your sales cycle is going to be held up. You need to know how to do that. And you need to know when you hand it over to product, how product works, right? Mm-hmm. And understanding, you know, when product is going to spin up um, a license for something in that sort of scenario, right? And in a B2B uh, software model that, um, or online cloud software model, we should say that you're spinning up a license and what does that process look like, right? So that you're well informed to say, okay, are we doing that the best way that we can? Because that's a part of customer experience. That's where you start handing over um, the ball to your customer success team and back to your marketing team, right? Because now they need to say, what do we need to be effective to keep this customer not just happy, but loyal. We, and you know, I mean, it's silly. The same stat's been around for eons about it's 50% less cost to uh, bring out a new customer or wait, to keep a customer than to bring yeah, out a new one, right? Exactly. And it's yep. been around forever, but it is so true. That, that like never changes. It just doesn't. <laughs> that one I will say with definitive uh, confidence, right? That doesn't change. So we need to be able to see throughout the different stages of that life cycle, what do those operational processes look like? You know, what is the makeup of the skill set needed to run those things? And if we don't, and we, we need to bring in help to fill the gap that we can do that quickly. Yeah. That's how we accelerate, right? 
is right. that gap analysis, I believe, is, is a huge accelerator. And within these growth operations, you're getting all of these people together, right, that know these customer-facing operations. And you're having those discussions and you're realizing and you're poking holes in it because most of the people have the operational mindset. They're like, well, why would I do that and not do it this way, right? And, and that's the dialogue that needs to happen. So it's really, really, I know it's strange that I've been across all these different things and I'm dangerous enough in each of them, <laughs> maybe a little bit more than dangerous, but dangerous enough in each of them to have and guide those conversations and um, know what it is that we need to ask. I think yeah. um, knowing what to ask is much more important than knowing. <laughs> Agreed. Ask <laughs> good questions. If you know what you know and that's all you know, and you don't know more than that, and you haven't asked the questions, you know, it's really hard to go from there. So yeah. you need to. It needs yeah. to be the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And you gotta, yeah. and, you gotta know to it. ask questions. Yeah. Right, and that you know, it's funny. You see that the mindset shift, right? And everyone's talking about the growth mindset. This is kind of where I'm going with this, right? I, I really feel so strongly about it because I think the growth mindset has really struck with a, a nerve with people, right? People really understood that. They're like, "Yeah, that makes sense, right?" Well, then why isn't it growth? Right? Mm -hmm. We all know growth comes from brand. It comes from the loyalty. It comes from the sales, right? And um, yeah, you get revenue because you've done a good job listening to your customers. That's where revenue comes from. You know, if, if someone is hearing you and is like, wow, first of all, wow, there's so much here. <laughs> I, wanna, I want mm -hmm. to follow you into the jungle. Welcome to the jungle. I want to follow you. <laughs> what is the first yeah. step they take in the growth ops direction? What's the one th very first thing you want them to do? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I'm going to answer this in a couple of different ways because I sure. think it depends on what functional area that you're launching from, right? If you're in marketing operations, the thing that I think is a trigger that happens, right? It, it's more trigger-based at this point than it is people are being terribly thoughtful about it. Not that some people aren't because they are, but the trigger for marketing operations is ABM, right? Mm. Um, because it's forcing you to have the conversation with sales and you're doing that with customers because it's mapping out the customer journey. So I think um, I'm going to sort of veer from where I was going in that I think that really is it. Like if you're going to start growth operations, take a collective look, getting your sales marketing channel and customer success teams together to look at your customer journey and do a gap analysis, list out what processes you have, list out what tools you're currently using, what's working, what isn't, what do the numbers look like, what do the goals look like, and sitting down collectively and looking at that and figuring out, okay, how do we do this? And again, it may force a um, centralization of some of those operations to start, and then you can decentralize, or you just keep a central organization, or you bring in a team from outside to do it, and that mm, helps you. Right. And supplements what you're doing, but keeps you on that path, right? They're going to be your project manager coming in to guide you on this path to work on that customer journey project. You're, you're identifying those segments, you're identifying, you know, do you have the skill set to um, execute on the campaigns and programs that you want to do? Are you measuring what you need to measure? Um, do you have data quality problems and how do you solve those? and put you on a roadmap to get there. It's not an overnight journey. Um, it's definitely, it, it can feel like you're sprinting a marathon uh, in some cases, depending on the growth of the company that you're in. There are companies be, yeah. that have, like, I mean, look at Snowflake, for example, and they're one of my favorites. And um, I did a data warehouse project with them. It took us two months, two months to put in a data warehouse. Do you know how fast that is? That's like insane. It and is. so they were, fabulous to work with and I don't have enough good things to say. And then what did they get? Like $470 million in funding. They had some like crazy funding and you're like, what? And you think about that and you're like, let me try to put growth operations in that model. Yeah. You're probably going to have to bring in people because that growth is, you have to think about scalability and you're already, everybody's already taxed out in that environment for sure. Because now they're like, oh yeah, we've got more money to spend. And somebody said this to me and um, I, will, I will take it to the grave because I think it is the truest thing that happens in systems and operations 
uh, the statement makes so much sense. And it says that nine women cannot make a baby in one month. Mm. And why that's so important is because you get people and they'll throw money at the problem, but the problem doesn't solve overnight. It's not solvable overnight. And so that's a big problem, I think, that when you're working operations in those really uh, rocket ship trajectory companies, that you really need to take into consideration that nothing is going to happen overnight. And if you try to do too much, you're going to have failures. It's just, you know, you fill a pool too fast and you didn't check for the holes, you're mm-hmm. going to have a problem. <laughs> I don't want to get flooded. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that's... Man, I, so... Stuff. You know, here's a here's another hypothetical for you. Like uh, I invented a time machine, and you can go back in time to let's say you, know, <laughs> you just graduated, or maybe the start of your career. What would you tell yourself? Yeah. You've experienced all the things you've experienced. You've seen things change and Siebel and all these different things evolve. What would you advise yeah. yourself? Um, I one thing that I did um, early on in my career that um, at some point in time I didn't do enough of it, but networking. It is so critical in a career to stay connected with the people that you work with and the people skills that you need to have in working because in any project, 100% of the time, the hardest thing is the change management. And so um, learning how to say no without saying no, right? Like, I would love to do that. We can do that next quarter and here's why. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, nope, we're not doing that. We're going to do it next quarter. Don't use the word no. (laughs) Not with senior leadership, right? So I think that um, that people connection and and networking, um, but and interacting in a way that you are going after the goal, but you're doing it in, in a way that you're proving what it is that you need to do and you're using that as a launching pad to do the next thing that you're going to do. So if you get successful on one project, you move on to the other. And you don't try to do, um, you know, four implementations at once. Believe me, mm-hmm. I've been there. It is nightmarish. Everyone's running like a chicken with their head cut off. Everybody is so stressed out. And it doesn't go well. It right. never, again, a definitive word, it never goes well when you try to do that. So um, I said earlier on, I'm a person who does a lot of things, but none of them are that difficult. <laughs> Maybe one of them are, right? Sure. So it depends on the, the uh, difficulty of what I'm doing. But um, when it comes to implementing technology, like a game site, a Salesforce, a Marketo, a Pardot, right? Um, utilizing a, that partner portal that you need to be focused on those projects. Mm-hmm. And if you're going and making changes over your market automation system, and here comes back to change control, right? And that change management, you're coming back to that. That if you did not have a change control process and you're doing all those projects at once, you're, mm-hmm. you're really screwed, honestly. Mm. So, but again, how do you get people to be influenced to change? And influencing change is just as important as making the change. You're not going to get to the change unless you influence the change. And that is not an easy thing to do, you know? And there it comes back to, guess what? If you haven't asked the question, why does it matter to them? You're dead in the water. You've got to ask that question. Why do they care? Why should the business care, right? Not all people are going to care about every project that you do, but the ones that matter that you need to be in the boat rowing with you, you've got to make the case for them to be in it with you and why it matters to them and what it's going to give them. Right. Mm -hmm. If they've got to go and prioritize a project that they didn't want to do, and because they've got their other projects they want to do, that really means more to them. That getting that buy-in is really difficult. So learning how to navigate that, I think, is um, something to pay attention to early on in the career. Is just watching how people navigate, watching how to say things a certain way. Um, I will say that I made so many mistakes along the way of just being kind of brash and I'm a straight shooter like I don't you know I tiptoe around things like I will just say it like it is but um there is a way of saying it like it is and there's a way of saying like it is way more nicely (laughs) Mm -hmm. so I think that one was a big one and um I actually went um to the um Harvard mentor management program 
And that was a huge focus in that program. And I think that um, it really prioritized that one for me as like it's flip flops between one and two for me now. Whereas, you know, prior to going to that program, it was probably in my top five. But now I realize, you know, the delivery of um, saying things will absolutely dictate the relationships you're going to have with people, right? And it sounds so simple, but you just don't realize it in every day that, you know, you're even doing it because your intention isn't to do bad. Your intention is Mm -hmm. to do good, but you always have to take into consideration how somebody else might, how they might perceive that, right? They may translate that differently than you. So I think that if I went back and I would just say like, pay more attention to other people and ask more questions. Perfect. Perfect. That, I mean, that is, it's so interesting. It's, it flies under the radar. It's something that, you know, watching how people navigate and how they say things in certain ways. And even if you want to just be that bull in the China shop and just smash Mario Smash Brothers, you can't yep. do that <laughs> very long if you still want to get buy-in and collaboration from people. It's, it's, uh, it's one of right. those soft skills to learn. Uh, is there a way to mm-hmm. learn that other than brute force trauma? observing how people are you know good what? at it? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, yeah, absolutely. That that Harvard program was amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I was very fortunate that the company that I was um, with at the time paid for it, oh, thankfully. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, but at the, I think there's still plenty of things to do, right? You know, read on the topic. Read on the mastering how to say no um, without saying no. Right. Mm-hmm. And you can go on Udemy and you can go on to Coursera. Uh, you can just Google it and find people talking about it. I, I like TED Talks a lot, by the way, because I think that the people who come in and do TED Talks typically have that recipe down of how to say things in a way that's very engaging. And um, there's a TED Talk specifically. I'll, I'll have to find the link and, and maybe you can share this out with the listeners sure. um, that talks about the best way to present. And there is a specific recipe that they said that like Martin Luther um, King Jr. speech followed and wow. um, major speeches, JFK speech, um, that they followed this specific recipe. They didn't even know they were doing it, but they followed it and wow. they were able to say like, if you do this presentation a certain way, it will be a winning presentation 100% of the time. Isn't that crazy? Really? So anyways, um, it was something that when we were going through OpStar that I would send our speakers and be like, you have, this is like fascinating. It's so amazing. Um, so yeah, I definitely will share that link if you want to share that out with everybody. It's, it's really cool. I just have to dig a little bit for it. Yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear about that. I'm I'm in a class right now to learn and then eventually do TED style talk to our local area. Yeah. I think I'm going to do it on marketing automation. Um, and actually, I think you should. <laughs> something like that yeah yeah it'll be fun yeah. I, really it's around the idea of not um trying to do one night stands with your customers you know actually dating them <laughs> you know and that kind of thing so yeah. but it, it's tough yeah. because the rest of people in the class all have these like really terrible experiences that happen to them so they're you know oh. these really dark experiences yeah. and i'm like hey guys are you are you trying to get in a fling with your customer like it just seems different but i'm still gonna use that because yeah. that's the thing that i love talking about so I think people probably yeah. could use a well, break I mean, from, it. from it too. You know, use a break from all the, the dark stories at, at an event to just have someone yeah. more lighthearted. Well, and I think there's so much comedy that comes out of talking about personal relationships and oh, drawing yeah. parallels to oh, what's totally. going on in business. Yeah, it's so, like, it's so much hey, fun, right? Spouse leaves, yeah, like your spouse likes to leave the cabinet door open and, and then gets passive aggressive and leaves that cabinet door open, right? Like, passive aggressive uh customers won't call you back it's kind of like that you know right. I, it's it's funny i think there's so many parallels that are there and i will definitely be looking forward to um, hearing you do that for sure you know you brought up a great one that won't call you back or the passive aggressive ones who send you the email saying <laughs> is this just not a fit do you just should we just not date you know should we just not do this right now going for the no you're like no you're Did like, you get the hint on the what? last email I ignored and reported as spam? <laughs> like, no, that's not going to work, you know? Yeah, obviously your unsubscribe didn't work, right? Yeah. <laughs> I went yeah. to your preferences center and made sure I unsubscribed to everything, but here you are, you got to get on emailing me. Oh, yeah, but it's I- a sales email. 
I like to take punitive damages and report spam whenever I can and block. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you did a terrible job. You're getting blocked and spam reported at the same time. Yeah. Uh, well, this I don't is crazy. understand why you can't spend 15 minutes. Yeah, oh, right. I get those all the time, and I just oh. You know what I'm gonna start doing though. If you buy my book, I'll I'll, I'll listen to your sales pitch for 15 minutes. <laughs> That's great. They're like, wow, Casey, you sold, you sold 10,000 copies of your book. Yeah, I've had a lot of sales pitches too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you man. know what? Maybe they can learn something in the process of getting the book and if they actually read it because right. it's an excellent read. I have to tell you, oh, I'm at the you. front end of it, admittedly, um, but I really like there's a lot of very prescriptive items that are in there that, you know, like I said earlier with the, the four words going into this, right? Yes. Um, and talking about foundation and growth and automation and recording and how critical, you know, every single one of those things are um, along the way in marketing automation. And that just goes across the business in general, right? right. Um, yeah. I see a, a lot of, of projects that I work on with clients is a lot of going back to the foundation and retooling it because it isn't working anymore. A lot of people go in to technology without an exit strategy, right? Mm. I think... Um, and I'm sure you see a lot of this as well. They're like, but well, we have this and we have this. It's like, yeah, but two of your tools are doing that as well. Why do you have four? And who's managing all of this? And, you know, you're not even maximizing on what you have. You're just putting things on top, you know. It's like Legos give you instructions. They give you <laughs> each of the bags with numbers on it, right? And they give you the step-by-step. -step. And if you don't follow it, guess what? It is so painful. First of all, it's painful to step on Legos. Second of all, it's painful when your child gets stuck building the um, Death Star and you miss two pieces and the whole thing won't go together. Right. <laughs> and it's, seriously, I mean, that's the foundation. Business foundation is if you don't get that, the, the Legos put in right, you don't get those foundational pieces put in right. It, it's like the outcome isn't what you expected it to be. And it's very frustrating. So oh, totally Legos that, and business foundation. Little block is like four or five widgets from the other one. If you put it three widgets yes. away or two widgets, you ignore that. <laughs> like you don't count them. You're like how, why doesn't the rest of this all fit? It's because you <laughs> skip that first part or uh, yeah. to your point, the really complicated ones trying to wing it by sight. Like, Oh, forget about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, and, and, you know, that's the fascinating part of the whole Lego movie or the master builders and how the heck oh. they know that. And it's kind yes. of like us, right? It's like we're the master builders within source operations and marketing operations and uh, knowing the path to take to build things out, that there is an absolute path to do that. I think that your book spells that out so well. And yeah. of books that I have read in this space, they haven't been this prescriptive. And so I think everybody that's listening should go buy the book. Um, it is absolutely worth it. High five to Casey. <laughs> there it is. Get that book. Get that book. For sure. Then tweet me a photo. So, yeah. I, <laughs> oh yeah, there we go. We need to do we need to do the um the marketing automation challenge, like the broom challenge. By the way, that broom challenge, do you know that I guess is you that, can stand up at any point of the day? <laughs> Apparently I read that anybody could stand up a broom any day. But someone started this whole thing about like, what is it? The wolf moon. And now the broom can stand. And I don't know. I saw a picture. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, explain it. So you, you like, you get a broom, you just make it stand up in your kitchen. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and they do. And, and I guess you can do it. I, apparently they do, but apparently you can do it at any time of the year. There was some rumor that the way the moon was positioned oh, made this geez. optimal thing. And, and all I can think of is the mystery spot in Santa Cruz, right? <laughs> wait, wait, there's a mystery spot? It's kind of like that, right? What's the mystery yeah. spot? Oh, boy. Okay. So, yeah, I forget. Um, if you're, you live in the Bay Area, you probably know the mystery spot. It's just a strange place, though. There's all of these different, like, structures and things that you can climb on. And you stand a certain way, and you're, like, standing straight up, although, like, you shouldn't be able to stand straight up, but you can. It, it's just, it's all, it's all physics, right? And so um, it's just, it kind of, it kind of makes you think a little bit more like how physics work. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, how does that, how is it that that building can stand up like that and not fall over, right? Like yeah. the Leaning Tower of Pisa, how is that possible? And it's, it's all in the physics. So it's a very peculiar spot and a lot of kids like to go there and I don't know, it's really run down and they need to, to update it but 
it's still nope. kind of cool. I'm looking at photos. Are the buildings like at an angle? Like <clears throat> sort of, yeah. I mean, okay. and, and it's all like you know, you look at the tree and you're like, oh, the tree's standing straight up, but it's actually not. So then the building looks like it's straight, but the tree's actually crooked. And, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Oh, so I it see. Really yeah. Is, uh, it's, you know. it's, all, it's all at an angle. So I see people leaning on chairs mm -hmm. and it looks like, and then you take the picture flat. So it looks like you just, you're flying. It's crazy. <laughs> well, I know what I'm doing next time I'm yeah. coming out west. <laughs> go yeah, go place. there and, and hit go to Santa Cruz or some uh, good wineries out there too, if you're into wine. So yeah, yeah. get one of those. It's uh, a good place to live. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, near proximity to wine is always a key factor of this. So <laughs> tell me where can people connect with you, you know, to reach out, to get more information, especially about um, as you're building the operations community now uh, around growth, what are the different links? Throw them out. Yeah, so I think LinkedIn is first and foremost for me. I'm on it every day, multiple times a day. Nice. Um, also, yeah, I, I think honestly that is the best place. Um, there's going to be more places to connect with me. As a part of the um, the growth operations community, we'll be launching a, an actual Slack community, um, and that's coming soon. We already have kind of a beta started with the internal team, and then we're looking to connect with other groups as well. Um, so I also am going to be um, on a committee with women in revenue for content. Um, so that'll be exciting. And that'll be another place to also connect and go into those events. Um, I also do go to a lot of events. I'll be at B2BMX coming up here in Scottsdale at the end of this month. Um, and I plan to be at several other events, um, Adobe conference this year. Um, so that'll be fun. And um, yeah, outside of that, I mean, I've got my email address and my phone. Let's do it. <laughs> so, uh, That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we will put all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here. I, mean, I don't know if you looked at the clock. It's like a time warp. We've literally just. Yeah, it is. <laughs> we've just talked and shared all sorts of different things. Um, so thank you so much for just sort of sharing all these things. I know you're passionate. You can tell you're passionate about this. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. Like I wake up and I'm like, huh. Um, have these moments of clarity and, oh, I've never thought of it that way. Maybe I should write about that. So today is a writing day for me. Um, I'll be doing more of that as well. And then I'm posting up on LinkedIn. Um, I'll be nice. doing some more stuff through um, MOCA, aka the growth operations community. Um, so there'll be more coming this year. I am working um, like yourself. You just wrote the book. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how you did this. Uh, but that is a goal of mine to, um, yes. to get this stuff and, and put Do these it. thoughts down on paper. Mm -hmm. yep. So, but uh, that'll be quite the undertaking. And in the meantime, you know, I do speaking engagements as well. And um, I should be a part of uh, OpStars again this year. So that's yet another way to connect. So um, I am the type of person that you can just ping me and I will, uh, I will definitely respond. So I'm not a person who will leave you hanging. Um, unless you're giving me a really bad sales pitch, that yeah. would, that's my passive aggressive approach. I probably won't get back in touch with you, but, Terrible um, LinkedIn yeah, sales people... approach. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Don't do this. Don't do that. <laughs> the metaphors for that in the dating world are just unmentionable. So for oh the my gosh. last thing here, uh, if you learned something, and I know you did, because I literally have two pages of notes over here, then <laughs> share this episode with someone. Be a thought leader to one or two or 30,000 people. Uh, but just get this information in other people's hands so they start thinking about growth. It's not just about the revenue. It's about how do you get, actually get there. It's the growth side. So, wow, this has been fantastic. Melissa, thank you again so much for being on here. Thank you, Casey. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. You bet. You bet. And for everyone listening, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. Catch y'all next time. All right. A big thank you to today's sponsors. Cheshire Impact, helping marketers and sales win, maximizing the use of Pardot and Salesforce. And a big thank you to Qualified.com, the number one live chat and chat bot platform for Salesforce and Pardot. Remember the giveaway. If you have Salesforce Pardot and you want a free copy of my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed, then you go over to qualified.com, engage in a chat, do a demo, and tell them that Casey sent you, and that book will be on its way to your door. All right. We'll see you all in the next one.